oh, bless you for being so easy to work with. <laughs> I, I, um, I don't know. I go a lot on feeling. I had a good feeling after listening to your audition. I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, this is going to work. Um, I, in the past, have been burned by some narrators who... Oh, really? Sorry to hear that. Never produced the product. But you were so ghosted. It, yeah, that's... That, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and getting uh, ACX to cancel a contract is... Boy, is that some hoops to jump through. But so I hadn't done any new audiobooks for a while because that experience had just been a little bit rattling. Um, and, but it, it's, it's just been so great to have somebody like professional with a fantastic voice. I have a really hard time listening to my own books being narrated. You it's mentioned like, it, was, it was a little scary to me after the audition. I think you sent me a message and said, I don't normally like listening to, and I'm thinking, oh no. No, I don't. <laughs> it's, it's like watching yourself on film, you know? Okay. Yes. It's um but like it was but I actually really enjoyed listening to to you do my book and I actually laughed at all the right parts. So that oh, was good. good. Aubrey left and Eugenie immediately got up from the council of toys she'd set up around her to scramble over to the sofa. She knelt in front of Heath and patted his head lightly in imitation of what she must have seen Aubrey do. Daddy's sick she said with a small pout. Yes, I am, darling, Heath said, reaching out from under the fuzzy blanket Aubrey had covered him with. But Daddy Aubrey is taking good care of me. Eugenie smiled, and Heath smiled in response. In response to what, he wasn't quite certain. Eugenie was precious, of course, but it was Aubrey and the care that the man had shown him in the last 24 hours that had Heath feeling like suffering through a cold might not be the very worst thing in the world after all. Now, do you usually drink tea, or are you drinking tea just because you're talking to an Englishman? <laughs> um, no, I, well, I drink coffee in the morning and tea in the afternoon, um, and it's British tea. It's the stuff that I got when I was over there last time. It's The, the tea is British. It's just Tetley's in the blue bag that you guys okay. get. The that's but the, tatlies, yeah. But you can't get like the good stuff like that over here in the U.S. But I also um, last time I was there, I got myself a box of sugar cubes. Yes, which you can't get over here either, if, because they're exactly the right amount of sugar. Exactly. Right. The right <laughs> yes, they are. I didn't realize you don't get sugar cubes in the U.S. I've never noticed. All well, the times I mean, I've been, I've never noticed. Right. We. I. Yeah. I, I like to tell people I was assigned American at birth, but I identify as British. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, I would move over there if you guys would let me. <laughs> oh, you were not allowed? No, because in 2008, the UK got rid of the artist's visa. So I'm, I'm a full-time author, and there is no longer a visa category in the UK that works for what I do. Wow. What about it, Ireland, which is very close? They do like writers there. But it's not the UK. It's not the UK. <laughs> I um, it's very woo woo um, actually because the very first I I have since I was a small child, like daydreamed about running away to England. Yes. And the first time I ever went to the UK, uh, gosh, it was about 15, 20 years ago now. Um, just to give you an idea of just how British I am, it was because my cricket team that I was the scorekeeper for did a tour in the UK, so I went with the team. Um, I think I was the only American woman who was also an internationally certified cricket scorekeeper for a while. Wait, you are but, more British than me. If you can, if you can score cricket. Yeah. It's been a lot. It's been a long time, but I, okay. yeah, I know how. And was this the test was, match cricket, five day cricket? Um, they, mostly they were playing T20 matches because it was okay, just. Okay, still, there's a lot of rules in cricket. Yeah. But um, the first time, um, so for whatever reason, we did a daytime flight. So we landed at Heathrow at night. And um, it was very, very dark when we got the rental car and we drove out to Winchester. And the next morning when I woke up and walked out into the streets of Winchester, I was like, I just came home. Like, really? I don't know. It was very woo woo. It was like, Whenever I'm in the UK, I feel like I'm home. Like, this is where my soul needs to be. 
And do you have British ancestors? Well, I, yeah, when, when I did the whole Ancestry.com DNA and 23andMe and like 98% of my DNA is from north of the English Channel. And a lot of it is Swedish. Uh-huh. Um, my mother's maiden name is Hall. You may be uh, familiar with some of my cousins. Um, <laughs> what, the Vikings? <laughs> well, the Hall. There is only one Hall family in the entire world. We're all related. Really? But yeah, they are my second cousins. So you're related um, to Jake? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, that's cool. Yeah, Jake and Maggie, they're my second cousins. I've met Jake once, and Maggie is my only cousin who I've never met. But really? just because, like, two ships passing in the night, we just always missed each other whenever we were. But yeah, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of creative people in my family. <laughs> So So. this explains, but this was going to be one of my first questions is why is the book set in London when you're in Philadelphia, right? Well, you know, yeah. And there's, there's, there's sort of a, a, like a longer explanation other than the fact that my soul is British. There's a slightly longer explanation, which is that the contemporary series that you're narrating is technically a spinoff of a Victorian series. So the very first Brotherhood series was set in the uh, 1880s and 1890s. Right. And th- those books came about because I was writing MF, Victorian and Regency. Yeah. And I inserted an MM book into just like a normal series of MF, Victorian. And I loved writing it and it did really well. And it just, it was, I, oh, I've always included queer characters in my books. And I thought, you know, why not just write an entire series that's just all gay men? So I came up with the idea of the Brotherhood and I wrote, I think there's 10 books in the Victorian Brotherhood series. And then I went back and wrote the Brotherhood Origins, which is four books from the 1830s telling the story of how the Brotherhood was founded, which is a fun story. And then I had this sort of an epiphany because about a year and a half ago, I was actually on a cruise. I was sitting in the solarium looking out at the the, um we were near Nassau and I was looking at the crystal blue water and the bright cobalt blue sky. And I was like, well, you know, I wanted to write something that I thought would, you know, I like to travel and that requires money. So I would like to earn money. Um, and I thought, why don't I just bring the brotherhood into the modern day? Because it would still exist. Of course, today. as, like, as lots of these British institutions do. From all that time. clubs, yeah, like whites and um, all those brook, they all still exist, yeah. um, questionably so. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought the Brotherhood still exists too, so I wanted to like just try out writing contemporary MM, and I love it. It's just I never thought I would enjoy writing these things, and it's just there are just all these stories. They're just like suddenly it's just so many things coming to mind and and i've been able to write things that are are just deep and meaningful because sometimes historical romance these days it's yeah it's deep and meaningful but sometimes it it's so removed from us i mean i have two two degrees college degrees in history so i i know a lot of this stuff but then to be able to write these contemporary stories about this same organization that has been in my mind in existence since the 1830s uh, it was really fun. And um, like some of I've made myself cry so many times writing these books now. Like, I don't know if you've gotten to the end of Billionaire Breakdowns yet. But No, I'm at I'm at book two, as you know, and I'm just over halfway. So I'm going through Oakley's challenges. And uh, it is it is quite emotional, some of it, because I don't want to get no spoilers here, but Oakley. <laughs> Oakley was in a very, very privileged position, worked really hard, but was in a very privileged position. And his life is just completely changed. And then he meets this guy through the circumstances of this catastrophe. And it is quite emotional seeing him adapt to it. And and the people around him try to adapt to that. And they're judging him as well. And it's it's very, very subtle, very, very nice. But I haven't got to the why. What 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 do I need to know near the end? Is the No, don't tell me too much. Have Kleenex on hand. Okay. 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 I, I, I made myself cry. <laughs> you really did. 
Yes, oh. I really did. And that does not happen that often. But I was sitting here, you know, typing away. And then I got, got to that part. You'll know when you get there. I got okay. to that part. And I was like. <laughs> So you'll get there. Okay. Okay. But, now- um, but that was that book. There's also a scene in that book that really ended up meaning a lot to me. I don't know if you've gotten there, but it's the scene where he goes to this restaurant. And it's yeah, he's not- just gone there and he's he's just gone to the restaurant and he's treated. Com- it's a restaurant that he would normally go to and be treated with almost celebrity status, with prestige. And he's treated oh. completely different by... First of all, by a pretty hoity French host. Um, and I don't know if you were having a go at the French there. So, but anyway, I'll just put it out there that there is a French host, but it's a restaurant. It's a French restaurant. So it's yeah. going to have a French host. And he's tri- and it really, it really is soul destroying, isn't it? And, and it, you know, Will tries to do his best to, to make the most of it, but he can still see that, that this this is quite the change for Oakland. Yeah, that is quite an emotional part of the book. Well, and, and part of that comes from, I have a very dear friend of mine who is blind and has been blind since she was four. And just um, around the time that I was writing that, we had had this conversation about, she said, the world is not designed for people with physical limitations um, because she was uh, pregnant, newly pregnant at the time. And she was like, I hope my child doesn't have the same inherited condition that I have because the world is not designed for people with challenges like that. And I thought, you know, that's true for everyone. That's, that's a great leveler because here is this man who the world is his oyster and he could do and have anything. And just like this physical challenge that he suddenly has, it just, the world is an entirely different place for him all of a sudden. And he's treated as an inconvenience and a nuisance and, and, and yeah. a problem for the business. It, the, for the restaurant itself, which is, it's just, considering he's a paying customer, it's disgraceful. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, uh, oh, they're, they're lovely, lovely books. So, so as a woman then, how do you go about writing a romance story between two men? You know, um, I, my whole life, I've had um, the queer community around me and some of the most wonderful, influential people in my life from the time I was a small child, have been gay men, including one of my best friends in high school, Ruben, who I still am good friends with. And it's, um, I personally also was always treated sort of as an outsider by the community that I grew up in. And um, one of my good friends who I worked with who was gay, he said something that was so profound to me once, it has affected my life ever since then, which is when he said, Um, When you realize at a very young age that you are not what society considers normal, it either makes completely messes you up or makes you very compassionate towards others. And um, I've always sort of like looked for that compassionate angle to things and just sort of to try, try to see things from different people's points of view. Because the, the, the amazing thing about being the writer is you don't have to have direct experience of the thing that you're writing in order to write emotions effectively. Like, um, I don't think Anne Rice was a vampire, although that one may still, the jury may be out on that. But um, it's just, this is, this is, I've always been a part of the community, if that makes sense. It's always been very close to me. So I just... So there's a like, sensitivity there in the community that you tapped into, I, is that right? I would like to hope so. I hope I've done it justice. It's sort of uh, writing these books is sort of my tribute to the people who have made me feel safe and uh, loved in a world that has not always made me feel that way. Uh, so it's just sort of my gift back again, if that makes sense. Yeah. You said growing up in the community you grew up in. You're in Philadelphia now. Did you grow up there? Because that's um, a big metropolitan I, city. Well, I mean, it's where I'm out in the suburbs. Um, okay. I <laughs> let's see. What can I say without getting too many people angry at me? I grew up in a very closed town that was surrounding a specific religion. Um, oh, I in don't want to necessarily use the words cult, but looking back, I'm almost I'm going to turn fifty this year, and looking back, I was like. I was totally raised in a cult. <laughs> I didn't even realize it at the time. But it was a very conservative 
very religious society with very um women were supposed to do certain things and behave a certain way you got married you had children the husband was the head of the household that whole the whole nine yards and um my mom was divorced she was i was in i when i first moved to this town it was the town where she grew up um and when i first joined the school there in 1980 i was one of two children whose parents were divorced in the entire grade that i was in um and like there were parents who would not let their kids play with me because my parents were divorced and i was corrupt sort of a thing so well, like you caused so, it <laughs> yeah well there there was something wrong with me obviously because i came from this environment and um it's just like and my mom was like i'm sorry everybody else on the entire planet in the history of the world my mom was the most wonderful person who ever lived and she passed away far too young in 2020 2001 um but yeah, growing up in this environment where I was, like, when I was in eighth grade, the girls in my class all got together to rank the class in order of popularity from most popular to least popular, and told me to my face that I was the least popular person in the class. So did that lead <laughs> to you escaping into books then? It did. I... I didn't like when everybody else was going down to the community pool in the summer times, I was just sitting at home reading books. And um, I started writing actually when I was about 10 years old um, because I just, every day I would go into to class and I was like, Oh, I hope Mr. Morley gives us a creative writing assignment today. I hope he gives us a creating. And, and he, and like suddenly one day this little voice in my head was like, you know, you don't have to wait for Mr. Morley to give you a creative writing assignment. You can just write something. And the rest is history. But and what uh, kind of stuff were you reading? What was influencing your writing? Um, I gosh, what did I loved? I don't know if there. I think all the books that I loved back then were out, are out of print now. But I loved um, Encyclopedia Brown. I don't know if you know those encyc the Encyclopedia Brown books. Um, they're kind of like the whole Nancy Drew sort of a thing, except for this. He was this guy whose nickname was Encyclopedia Brown. And there were, um, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the guy, but he wrote um, East of the Sun, West of the Moon was one of the books that he wrote. And he wrote a whole bunch of, like, they were all written in like the 19, 1901 and 1905, like these books that my school library just had. I loved those. Um, they were all anthropomorphized animals. And then... Um, I, this is so embarrassing. I had a babysitter one summer who was really into soap operas, like Days of Our Lives. And like at age 10, I got hooked on soap operas. So that says so much now, about now, me. East of the Sun, West of the Moon. I've just Googled it. Jackie Morris. Is that, they, the, is that, the, is that the me, Yeah, I think that's one. And then, um, oh gosh, that was one. And then Old Mother West Wind and her children or something. What is, Burgess, was that the, author's name um old mother west west, west wind, wind i, west think wind, that I got called. that yeah and that is uh thornton w burgess yes i think i read everything that thornton w burgess wrote because they were <laughs> they're just like cute little stories but like I, all of those very imaginative um just sweet stories and then of course as i got older wow what did i Gosh, I started reading everything, and then I started picking up romance. But how were they related to soap opera? You're talking TV soap operas, the real well, stuff. It's that, like, it's like the narrative. Like Peyton Place or, or, or Days of Our Lives. Or... Days of Our Lives. It was Days of Our oh, okay. Lives yeah. in the 80s all the way. Yeah. But it was it was something about the narrative of the story that I just, I like, of course, Days of Our Lives or soap operas in general, they like will draw a plot out over weeks and weeks. Yeah. And, you just and there's do... overlapping stories, isn't there? So if yeah. you're only following one, the other one's got a little while to hook you yet before they drop yeah. the, before they conclude the, the, yeah. I yeah. See. Oh yeah. And I loved um, uh, Lucy Montgomery. I read all of the Anne of Green Gables books, all of the Emily books, which are better than Anne of Green Gables, but don't get as much attention. Okay. But, um, I just, and then I started just writing fan fiction of things. Like I wrote Days of Our Lives fan fiction in middle school because wow. of course you do, as one does. And I wrote Indiana Jones fan fiction. And then I got, then I turned into a Trekkie and I wrote Star Trek fan fiction. 
and like all sorts of fun stuff. But that's how I entertained myself. I would write if I, like the movie Labyrinth, which is the beginning of puberty for me. If you know anything about David Bowie's yeah. pants in that movie, um, I rewrote the ending because I didn't like the way it turned out. <laughs> so, that's the great you know, thing about being creative. If you don't like the way something turns out, you can change it. Yeah. Well, yeah. And like, that's true for my life too, <laughs> because you know, I didn't like the way that was going. So I'll just write something else. Um, I actually was a character in a lot of my early stories yeah. and then, you know, and then I, I got over that by high school, but um, yeah, it was, it was fun. And then um, in high school, I started sharing the things that I wrote with my friends and classmates. So like I had a, I would write in a spiral bound notebook because this is the late eighties, early nineties. And, you know, nobody had computers and stuff like that back then. So I would hand around the notebook to people. So that was a lot of fun. Wow. And so then, they actually read the original. Yeah. That, well, it was really hard for me to give that up sometimes too. It's like, okay, you can come over to my house, but you have to sit and read this and then give it back to me when you're done reading it, because I need to keep writing this story. So <laughs> that was fun. And um, then, so that's high school. Then you go and study, is that then straight after high school that you studied and got your two degrees in history that you mentioned? Yes, but there is an intermediary up. step there too, okay. because after my senior year of high school, I got a job as an actor at the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair. So I ended up running around pretending to be an Elizabethan peasant for two summers. Um, it was like a 16 week thing um, where it's open to the public, but they did a eight week rehearsal training course before the beginning of each fair year. And we would study history from the point of view of, okay, you have to enact this for people to make it as real as possible. So it was the first time in my life that I realized, wow, all this stuff actually happened. People actually lived this way. And, you know, Shakespearean English, that's because that was the colloquial language that people spoke albeit Shakespeare threw so many metaphors and things in there too. Um, and it really opened my eyes to the fact that people actually lived these lives. This, this is not just something you're reading about in a book. Um, and that's what inspired me to go major in history because I knew then I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to write historical romance because that's what I was reading at that point. Um, and I know I, I I wanted to always have something to write about. So a lot of times with my historical romance, people were like, well, how do you do the research for your historical romance novels? And I'm like, it was like a grand total of six years worth of college and several tens of thousands of dollars in tuition. <laughs> That's how I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but um, yeah, because it's, just, I love so studying. You're, very, love you're very lucky. You got onto a path that took you exactly where you wanted to go and didn't really deviate at all. It's well, I mean, I did because <laughs> so so when I went so the reason I have two degrees in history instead of just one is because I originally thought I was going to be a high school history teacher. Some stuff happened. I was working at a school. It's a long story. <laughs> So I went back and got the second degree. And then I realized, well, in order to make myself more marketable as a history teacher, I, I need another skill on top of that. So I had done a lot of theater and I thought, well, I'll go back and get a master's degree in theater. So then I can, and, and do it, um, which I did at Villanova University, but I did it from the academic track, which is for like people who plan to teach. <clears throat> and, and, and halfway through earning that degree is when my mom passed away. And it suddenly made me like question everything that I was doing. And um, since my parents had divorced when I was six years old, and I thought, <laughs> oh, fate, how fickle you are. Um, I thought, this is a great opportunity for me to reconnect with my dad without feeling guilty for, you know, leaving my mom and, and, and wanting to pursue this. Well, I learned very quickly that it takes two people to want to have a relationship. And I spent a couple years just lived, my dad lived in Alabama. So I moved to Alabama. <sighs> Alabama. And, south, um, not, not for you. <laughs> no, I learned from living in Alabama that not only am I a Yankee, I'm a damn Yankee. So <laughs> I, I actually, I was 32 years old. I weighed 99 pounds because when I get depressed, I don't eat. When I'm happy, I eat. So if I'm ever really overweight, it's because I'm happy. Um, but 
like I I had to leave. But the process of doing that sort of it was a big detour to all the things that I had thought that I wanted to do with my life. And it wasn't then until the advent of self-publishing in around 2009, when everybody was suddenly talking about, oh, well, you know, hey, Amazon has this thing now where you can just write a book and put it up for sale and let's do that. Um, Because I had, by that point, I had started writing things and I had been submitting to agents and the way that one did back in the old days. And I just, I didn't like the process. I didn't like the fact that it, whether or not I was published came down to one person's opinion. And if, if I just didn't tickle that one person's fancy, then that was it. I, I didn't get to, to achieve the dream that I wanted to do since I was 10 years old. So then when someone came around and said, oh, well, no, you can just do it yourself now. I was like that. Yeah. That's what I want to do. And that it democratized I, it, democratized it, didn't it? Oh, yeah. It, it may, yeah. It was, well, a, you a, know, and it's massive now. Oh, yeah. Well, (laughs) I was lucky that I actually ended up hooked up with a very good editor right from the start. And I learned more about the craft of writing from that editor than I did from any craft book or writing class or anything that I've done. And And I also I'm a very disciplined person personally, so I was able to handle doing self publishing as a career. Um, Whereas I know a lot of people from those early days, they just they they couldn't they, they weren't it takes a lot of discipline. I work from six o'clock in the morning until five thirty in the afternoon, six days a week. I used to be seven days a week, and then I decided I needed to take Sundays off, or I was going to lose it. So, mm-hmm. But um, nowadays, self-published authors who take it seriously and do it um, as if you know it is my it is my career, it is my job. Um, I work at it every single day. Um, we, well, it, I, it, in general, we make more money than a lot of people do who go the traditional route. Mm-hmm. Um, well, there's not as many people in there taking a piece of it off you. <laughs> exactly. And um, uh, yeah, because I've been offered three different contracts from traditional publishers. And um, some of them were pretty big name publishers. And when they sent me the contract and I looked at the amount that I would earn in royalties, like what they wanted to give me as an advance, and then what they projected the lifetime earnings of the book would be, I was like, that's what I make off of a book in two months. <laughs> and you you want me to give you my intellectual property that I've worked and slaved over for like a fraction of the money that I could make off of it myself? No. So <laughs> I did I did do one series with... Uh, a publish a small publisher and it it was a regency mm series and mm-hmm. they this particular small publisher did not know how to market gay romance correctly right. to the right people because it's a it's a very niche genre yeah. overall yeah it's got to be in the right place it's even more yeah yeah and so take me through a typical day six days a week because i i i know how you, how you you know, I came to it. I came to audiobook narrating a slightly different way. I'd been in radio for 29 years, and the pandemic hit, and I suddenly got fired, and no one was interviewing for radio jobs. So I started have to earn a living from home, and started doing audiobooks for mostly independent authors around the world. And I found myself. Well, I'm still trying to get down to six days a week. I'm working seven at the moment, <laughs> from six in the morning until about five, five thirty, six yeah. o'clock. Um, and, but it's just such a fulfilling way to live because you're in control of your own time and your own destiny. And I can see how that, how it takes over. Cause it has with me, I work on up to eight books at a time. Do you work on just one book at a time? Uh, well, take us through a typical writing day for you. So I, I'm at the point now where I, I so would say for a, any given book, my writing process is like three steps long. I outline, I'm a big outliner because I learned way back in the day that if I want to produce, if I want to get all of these stories and thoughts in my head down and out there for people to read fast, I need to to like know what I'm going to write when I sit down every day. So I, I'm a big outliner. So I do the outlining and then I do the drafting and then I do the self-editing process. All um, on the same book, on one book at a time? 
Yeah, now I've gotten to the point where I do just work on one book at a time. For a while there, I was I would overlap, like I would be drafting one and doing editing for a different one or outlining for a third one. But it's just like I I write I have two really active pen names, um, and I write about three different genres, so I have to keep things straight. So I just do it one at a time now. Um, but I'm. But I like I'm I'm really disciplined about how I do it. So I write about two chapters a day. That's about six thousand words. And I generally, if I'm writing a full length novel, I aim for twenty chapters, maybe a prologue, epilogue, depending. Um, if I'm writing a novella, it's ten chapters. Um, so I can draft a book in two weeks. But I so much time has gone into thinking about that and outlining it and fleshing out the characters. And I know everything that's going to happen in each chapter before I sit down to write it. And then once the whole thing is written, then I go back through and I read it. And I'm the queen of typos. You probably found some that like five different people will read through these and they still slip through. Oh. I haven't seen any. I haven't seen any, Mary. I can honestly say I haven't seen any. Haven't seen but any. Um, so I go through and I correct that. But then I do the whole thing of, uh, does this work right here? Do Does this guy's motivation, is it like... Is it coming through clearly enough? And I have an editor who will like read it and give me notes on things and then I'll spruce it up and fix it up. So that's like over. So I guess it'll take about two months from start to finish for a specific book, even though um, I, I think about a lot of these stories and the characters like live in my head for a long time before they end up on the page. Um but then, like, in terms of on a daily basis, I get up at 5.30. I do about an hour worth of admin. Um, accounting is this awful thing that I've had to learn. This creative history brain of mine <sighs> has to deal yeah. with accounting and marketing and sales. And I just, it did not come naturally to me. Um, I'm finally, after 13 years of publishing, really trying to work on a budget. Like, I actually right. have spreadsheets with, this is your budget for the month do not go over this amount because it's like not good to do that. No. Um, and then I write in the morning because I'm a morning person. But then in the afternoon, that's when I do a lot of this stupid marketing stuff that I've had to learn. And my big thing last year was graphic design. I was like, I need to get better at doing my own graphics, like ad graphics. My, I have a wonderful cover designer. So there's about three that I work with that make my life so much easier because they do such beautiful covers that it makes it so much easier for me to just design a ad graphic around that. Um, and I'm involved in so many different projects with different groups of writers in terms of, I, I, I have been publishing for 13 years. Uh, no, it's 14 now. Cause that's right. Cause it's 2024. Um, and I, I love to be able to give back to newer authors who are just sort of getting started. So I'm, I'm involved in a fun project in, um, with a group of MM authors. We're, we're writing together like a historical, magical fantasy thing. It's, it's a bunch of vignettes that take place at a ball um, that we're, we're making up a lot of this stuff as we go along, but it's just like a lot of fun to work with these guys and um, just, different skill levels different like i've never written a story before but i've always wanted to to i've got two or three books published but i could get better and i just i love being able to share the things that i have learned over the years because there's there's no co like college course or book that can really prepare you for what it's actually like to be a writer you have to learn through doing it so i just want to help some of these people along like here let me throw you into the, the pond. Wee, here we go. Let's swim. <laughs> so it's it's uh, it's just what I love to do. So it's fun doing that. I'm, I'm in a couple of multi-author projects that are a lot of fun. And I just, the writing community is a fun place to be. Um, yeah, and again, I've met uh, hundreds of authors since I've been doing this. And they are just, I mean, amazingly diverse people. <laughs> but really, really good people who've you know because they've put their heart and soul into the work this is not a work that you just phone in this has a piece yeah. of you in it and it takes a certain yeah. kind of character to do that and i've met some wonderful people in the oh, writing good. community really yeah <laughs> in including yourself now uh -huh. a new york times best-selling author goodness me well not new york times 
USA no, Today. To, USA Today. Okay, I'm sorry. USA. Oh, There's, who cares? Who cares? We're in Britain. We don't know the difference anyway. <laughs> one of them, you buy your way onto the list, and the other one is actual book sales. So Got it. Got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you mentioned characters earlier then. Well, in this book, Nanny Negotiations, the first in, in this series, where do the... Well, I've only done the first book and we're into the second one, so they're brothers, but where do those characters come from? Because they're very British characters, and I know you're an Anglophile, but <laughs> where, 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 are they people that you've met along the way? I mean, you mentioned I the community know. that you were involved in, but it, uh, is, is there bits of them in there? Um, I, I don't know where they come. They're just there. They're all in my head. I don't know. Someday when I have shuffled off this mortal coil, I will probably discover that all of my characters are probably in some other realm and I'm just channeling them. <laughs> um, but no, it's funny because people ask me, so where do you come up with your story ideas or how do these characters become so real? And I'm like, I, 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 there's no explanation for it. I just feel like I'm relaying information from somewhere. Um, yeah, some characters... They, they they get to be way more real to me than others. I have a series of books that is now three series, actually, 17 books total, that I started writing during the pandemic to just to entertain myself, and I never intended to publish them, starting with a book called Peter and the Wolves. Um, the series is called Peter and the Wolves, and the three main characters of that series, Peter, Magnus, and Neil, have become so real to me that I just... I just had them tattooed on my arm <laughs> no hold that right up just to wow oh, yeah so Look i got that. that that was my christmas present to myself because they're so real i just wanted them with me forever <laughs> but like i don't i don't know how to just to describe it um they just become so real when you're when you're a writer and you're creative I, yeah there's just i don't know how to describe it but these guys um heath and aubrey they're just like they're just like guys I would like to hang out with. <laughs> but they're so different. I mean, they're yeah. from, you know, they're class apart. And you know the British class system is is very alive and well here. And it differs <laughs> yeah. from what I've noticed in America with the class system. In America, the class system is based on money. In Britain, it's not. A lot of these upper class people are broke. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. but not, not in your book, obviously. Um, Heath is, is by no means broke. But... Uh, <laughs> Um, Heath and Aubrey, they uh, they they come together under very strange circumstances, but they really are right for each other. They're good for each other. They help. They I make each so. other better people. You don't think? Oh yeah, no. It's like I say. Oh, I, yeah. hope, I hope they do. They, oh like, sorry. They're, they're, they're good for each other. They are um, very good for each other. Yeah. Like I just think about their parents too, because like they have very different parents. Yes. Oh, I would love to be a fly on the wall when those two sets of people meet up. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, especially... I think it'd be funnier if... I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to work out, would, would it be best for the for the Cornish to go to London or the London... I think if the London went to Cornwall, I think it would be funnier. I think if oh, Pete's parents just... went to Aubrey's parents, uh, that would be the funniest. Oh, Aubrey's parents would, like, pull out all the stops to host them, but, like, I don't know if those are necessarily the stops that uh, Heath's parents would want pulled out. So. Oh, especially if they didn't keep their clothes on. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're fun. So, so how did you find it then? You've, you've put all the work into this and then you've handed it over to someone. I mean, we hadn't even spoken. Uh, this is the first time we've, we've spoken and seen each other. Um, you hand it all over to this strange bloke who lives just outside London and go, okay, <laughs> see what you got, kid. Um <laughs> How was the experience of turning it into an audio book for you? Um, it, you know, it was great. You, oh, bless you for being so easy to work with. <laughs> I, I, um, I don't know. I go a lot on feeling. I had a good feeling after listening to your audition. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, this is going to work. Um, I, in the past, have been burned by some narrators who. Oh really? Sorry to hear that. Never produced the product you were so ghosted was, yeah that's that yeah um yeah <laughs> and getting uh acx to cancel a contract is boy is that some hoops to jump through but so i hadn't done any 
knew audiobooks for a while because that experience had just been a little bit rattling. Um, and, but it, it's just been so great to have somebody like professional with a fantastic voice. I have a really hard time listening to my own books being narrated. You it's mentioned like, that. Well, it was a little scary to me well, after the audition. I think you sent me a message and said, I don't normally like listening to, and I'm thinking, oh no. No, I don't. <laughs> it's, it's like watching yourself on film, you know? Yes. It's, um, but like it was, but I actually really enjoyed listening to, to you do my book and I actually laughed at all the right parts. So that oh, was good. Great. Yeah. Well, that's good. Seeing as you knew they were coming, you knew. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's uh, just today I saw a really funny meme of like a woman saying, "Oh my gosh, I I forgot how this book ended." And then like her husband asked, "Did you have you read that one before?" She's like, "No, I wrote it." And like that that's a real thing. <laughs> you know? I've gone back and read some of my books, and I'm like, I can't remember what happens next. But um, no, there's like, yeah, it was it was. Very reassuring to hear the my words interpreted just how I imagined it should be, and I've had I've had a few compliments from my diehard core readers who have listened to the narration and they're like, "Oh my gosh, he's a great narrator!" So yay, you get well, the reader stamp of approval. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, I hope we can do many more. We've got the rest of this series to do. We're currently working on uh, book two. They're the Brotherhood Legacy book. One is Nanny Negotiations. That's out now as an audio book. The second one will be out soon. I'm just over halfway through that one, so that one will be out soon. What's next for Mary Farmer? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I, um, I'm continuing with the, the, the Brotherhood Legacy series. Um, it's going to be six books total. Um, and then I, I want to continue writing MM Contemporary but I have yet to decide whether I want to switch to doing first person, which seems to be more common for contemporary. The reason I did this series in third person is because historical is usually third person. And since it's a continuation of the same brotherhood organization that I did in the historical books, I wanted to keep that continuity, mm -hmm. but I do want to do another contemporary MM series. I just have to decide do I want to set it in England and make it a spinoff of what I'm doing? Or do I want to take it to America? And I don't really want to do the U.S., but I don't know. I'll decide on that later. But I still write um, F historical as well, mm -hmm. which is what I started my career writing and where I gained a lot of my following originally. And I have not really written MF historical for a little over a year because I was just out of ideas. Um, but I had an idea. And I had to, like, finally, it's like, oh, I've got an idea. Because one of my most popular MF historical series involves older heroes, like the Silver Fox heroes. Because, frankly, the audience for MF historical is, like, 40s and 50s and 60s and older. Um, so I was in the UK in October um, just visiting some friends. And I went up to Inverary and stayed with a friend of mine who lives in an 800-year-old castle up in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And we went and toured a bunch of different castles and we went to one. Oh, I can't remember because we went to several of them, but one of them had a curse. So we, the, the whole, the tour guide was talking about the, this castle and how it's cursed. And, you know, one of the original inhabitants of the castle, there was a woman who was scorned and like three different stones that were separated. And until the stones were brought back together in the castle, the, the, family who owned the castle would have great tragedies befall them. And it, and it's happened ever since the beginning and like one thing after another. And there was a guy who killed his, like star locked his wife in a room and starved her because she only had girl children and he wanted a, a son. And now that we know about genetics, that makes the guy even bigger jerk. But anyhow, so I thought, Oh, I need to write about this cursed castle. Yes. So I have, I'm writing, I just started the first book in the series today of um, these older gentlemen, you know, 40s and 50s, it's older for the Regency, who the last one of them to get married has to inherit the castle. So yeah, that's the, the first that book in that series. Weird. What are they well, the called? First book, the, that one is called Unlucky in Love because they're all still single in their 40s and 50s because they just had terrible luck. And <laughs> um, the first book in that series is called Aged to Perfection. 
And the reason why that hero has not yet married is because he's been a little bit busy running the family's cheese making business. So, yeah. <laughs> that sounds great. Okay. Well, it's remind really me fun. of your website again. Where can we find out more about Mary Farmer? It's at maryfarmer.net. Maryfarmer.net. Dot com was taken at the time 14 years ago. So I got maryfarmer.net. Um, Okay, I'll put a I'll put a link to that in the description. If you're watching this on YouTube, I'll put a link to maryfarmer.net. You so you can go there and you can check out all Mary Farmer's work. There'll also be a link there to Audible, so you know where to download Nanny Negotiations. And any other links I should put in there while we're thinking of them? You um, know? I'm on Instagram at yeah. Mary Farmer. That and I have a Facebook group, um, Mary Farmer Readers, which I right. like to call Mary Little Lambs. <laughs> um, there was a thing about a little less than a year ago where a lot of the MM author groups that I'm part of, the authors had had a cute name for their group, but they didn't have their actual author name as part mm -hmm. of it. So people were having trouble searching for the Facebook okay. group. And yeah. I realized my Facebook group was just Mary Farmer's Readers. And I thought, wait, I need a cute thing to go with my name. So it was Mary Little Lamb. <laughs> but, um, I, I mean, I, those are the only two social media that I can handle, Facebook and Instagram, because the artist formerly known as Twitter is just too nasty for me. TikTok, okay. yeah. that's such a time suck. <laughs> I, yeah. can't, I can't Idiot. do it. Yeah, yeah. I can't yeah. do it, man. But, okay. um, but I'm well, pretty I'll active. The, I'll put links to all those. And there'll be, if, if nothing else, there's links to them on the website anyway. So that's like the gateway to everything, really, isn't it? Maryfarmer.net. That's the... Mm -hmm. The gateway drug to the Mary Farmer addiction. That's uh, the way And then I also, I have my other pen name, um, M.M. Farmer. M.M. Farmer, I write yes. Omegaverse under that pen name. And I don't know if you know anything about Omegaverse, but that's no, some tell me about that. What Omegaverse. Is that? is that fantasy stuff? Yes, it is where a world where there are alphas and omegas and betas are normal people, but male alphas, male omegas, and men can get pregnant. Because right. the omegas go into heat and they just really need an alpha around to have fun with. It is the weirdest genre. <laughs> and when I first heard of it, I was like, no, that's no, that's just too weird. There's no way. I will never read that genre ever. And then I was convinced to read a couple of books. And then I read one called Clutch by Piper Scott and Virginia Kelly, which also is Dragon Shifters. All right. And this book was so amazing. That whole series was so amazing. I was like, this is the best genre ever, and I have to write it. So, so that's in there. And that says, uh, and in that name, is that the, the, the author name in that one? M.M. Farmer. M.M. Farmer. Is in just there. because, you know, I wanted to separate it enough because it's so different from what I've been writing, um, yeah. but like still let people know it's me. And well, I do all my social media for the same name. Um, it yeah. has to do also with Amazon algorithms, which is yeah. the most boring reason to have a pen name. <laughs> and yet one of the most important. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. Well, it's been lovely hanging out with you like this across the Atlantic. I hope yeah. you will cross the Atlantic physically again one day. If you were back here I in October, there. how often? I'll be there be at here? the end of March. End of March. Well, you please let me know. You're going to be in London? Yeah, I'm staying with a friend in Carshalton. Okay. Well, let me know when you're here and we'll go and get some lunch. Um, Sounds good. Yes, we will do that because I'm meeting an, an author I work with in Florida in May and we're going for lunch uh, uh, in the city as well. So we'll we'll go somewhere nice and we'll have a good time and be on me. What, It'll be my treat. What part of London uh, are you in? I'm just outside London. I'm actually in Hertfordshire. Do you know, straight north of London is Hertfordshire. Uh, I'm staying in Hatfield for a month in August. Hatfield's <laughs> down the road. You'll be going to the Galleria, which is, you know, we've been shopping. We've been to the movies at the Hatfield. I'm in Hitchin in Hertfordshire. Do you know Hitchin? Yeah, yeah. That's like a couple of stops north of the Hatfield Yeah, we're about half an hour on the train from King's Cross or St Pancras. So half yeah. an hour. And it's, so I'm in Hitchin. I used to work in London. I used to commute in. And, uh... So yeah, oh well, it's gonna be. It's yeah, gonna you're gonna be, be like in August. So I'm gonna be, so I'm gonna be there from uh, March 21st because I'm going to the Indie Pride Con um, book signing extravaganza on March 23rd in Blackpool. 
Mm-hmm. But then I have a book signing in Paris on April 6th. So Ooh, I'm just la la. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm coming back in August because, um, because I have a book signing in Edinburgh in beginning of September. Yeah. But um, again, I, I am an Anglophile. I would so much rather be over there than here in the U.S., particularly in the summer because it's just too hot where I live mm-hmm. now. Yeah. And um, I'm a woman of a certain age where I have become very sensitive to heat. And I thought, I can't sleep in the summer, but maybe if I just stay for the entire summer or as much of it as I can in the UK, it does get cooler at night mm-hmm. in general in the summer yeah. there. So, Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that will be nice. Well, please let me know. We're in touch now. So let me yeah. know when you're over. And that could be fun. We'll have, we'll have a nice lunch in London or, or even in Hitchin or who knows, or yeah. Hatfield. Who knows? Yeah. Great. <laughs> Mary I'm Farmer saying right next to Hatfield House. Right now, oh, well, Hatfield House was one of our. I worked for a radio station in the home counties, and Hatfield House was one of our advertisers. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, I love yeah, it. we used to. Yeah, it's nice. It is nice. Yeah, and uh, a lot of history there too. A lot of history. Oh yeah, there. I have a friend who works as a docent there, and she she let me in on a lot of the history too about the house. So, yeah, great. Very- yeah, we did a. Um, the radio station did a big. Um, it was a fireworks display. It must have been bonfire night. I think it was bonfire night, and we did a uh, we did a big show there on stage, and did the big countdown to the fireworks, which is what radio stations tend to do. <laughs> and um, of course, these fireworks events, the, the whole trick is trying to get away because you get to the end, you do the big countdown: five, four, three, two, one, and the fireworks set off, right? And you've got <laughs> basically the length of the fireworks display to get out. Because if you, as, as a host, because if you don't get out then, you can't get out because of the traffic. Yeah. <laughs> and it was yeah. in the middle of the week and I was doing the breakfast show. So I had to be up at four o'clock in the morning. So this is getting to like eight, nine o'clock at night. I want to go. So you've just got to go. So I, I talked to one of the security people and he told me I could drive my, where I could drive my car in. I parked my car right next to the stage. And I thought, great, I'm golden. So we do the, the countdown at Hatfield House. I go, five hundred and one. Fireworks go off and I get in my car and I drive off out of the place through this field. And it was like something out of James Bond. I didn't know <laughs> where I'd driven in was where all the fireworks were set up. So I'm oh, driving no. the car thing, and there's fireworks going off all around me. And they said they nearly stopped the display because they didn't realize I wanted to go out the way I came in. They thought I'd be going out a different way. No, that's the reason why I wanted to part there was to get away. So uh, <laughs> it was nearly a bigger show than they'd planned for, I tell you. That was... That was my last memory of. I think it was the last time I was at Hatfield House. Actually, was, that sounds very was James Bond. Though. It felt yeah. like I felt like James, and it was a two seat sports car as well. It was only a Mazda. It wasn't. It wasn't anything exotic. It was, it was, but it was a two seat sports car through the. Maybe people thought it was part of the show. I don't know. Hey, that would have made it. That's made a great finale. You know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's hope we uh, we don't have any disasters with fireworks or anything when you come to see us in London. So that'll be great. Oops. Yeah. Fingers so crossed. That's, when do you think that is? Not March. End of March, did you say? Uh, yeah, I will be. Um, well, of course, I, I arrive March 21st, but then we're going straight up to Blackpool. And I think we get okay. back on the 25th or 6th. And then I'll just be hanging around until I head back down to Paris. If you're still around in May, you can meet Danielle, who's this author from Florida who I work with. And she'll be in town as well. I mean, we I'll be back out. here at that point. Oh, you'll be back there. Well, okay. You guys have to change your visa categories and I'll move over there permanently. (laughs) Well, until you do that, I'll see you when you come and visit. And if ever I'm in Philadelphia again, I've only been once, I'll look you up. Oh, definitely. Thank you so much. Please stay in touch. Thank you.